Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. If not, please just do send me a chat. Um, uh, I will uh, just today uh, provide a brief introduction before we get started with our speakers. Um, for those of you uh, who don't know and who haven't been to the series before, this is the Global Social Theory uh, Lecture Series. And um, uh, my name is Julian Goh. I'm professor of sociology here at Chicago and organizer and convener of this series. Uh, the series is an extension of my course here at Chicago. Uh, the course is called Global Social Theory. Um, and it's sponsored by Chicago's Global Studies program. And so I'd really like to thank that program for making this possible and especially Professor Kimberly K. Huang, the director of the program and my colleague here in sociology. Um, and I'd also like to thank the team at Global Studies, Lee Price and Brian Finati uh, for putting it all together. Um, I'm really, really excited today to present our speakers, um, Jose Itzigson and Professor Karita Brown. Uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce them uh, and then I'll turn things over to them. Uh, we will hopefully uh, have time for discussion and questions um, and I'll, I'll instruct you all on, on how we'll manage the question and answer period. Um, so let me uh, just go ahead and introduce by alphabetical order. Um, our first uh, speaker uh, is, is Karita Brown, who is assistant professor in the Department of African American Studies and Sociology at UCLA. Um, she's also the inaugural director of Racial Equity and Action for the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, she earned her PhD in sociology from Brown in 2016. Um, and an MPA in government administration from Pennsylvania in 2011. Uh, her research focuses on the relationship between race, social transformations and communal memory. Um, she's the author of various articles and uh, the book Gone Home, Race and Roots Through Appalachia, which has won a number of prizes and awards and a fantastic book. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, she's also the co-author with uh, Jose Itzigson of the book the Sociology of W.E.B. Du Bois, Racialized Modernity and the Global Color Line, which is the topic today. Um, Jose Itzigson is professor of sociology at Brown University. Uh, he graduated from Johns Hopkins in 1995. He's the author of many scholarly articles and essays, as well as the books, Developing Poverty and Encountering American Fault Lines. Um, he is the co-author of The Sociology of W.E.B. Du Bois with uh, Carita. Um, and I, just on a personal note, it's fantastic to have them both here. I'm so happy they agreed. Um, you know, I, I was in Boston for a while and um, had some great uh, uh, formative intellectual experiences with Jose and his students. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's great to, to, to reconnect. And thank you both for coming. They're going to talk today about the sociology of W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, without further ado, I'll turn things over to them. Thank you, Julian, for organizing this series and for inviting us. And thanks to you know all the people that join us today, this afternoon here. Uh, if by any chance uh, you don't hear me well, let me know. But you know sometimes happens. Um, so we are going to talk about the sociology of W. E. B. Du Bois. That is the book that we co-authored, and we wrote this book. Uh, basically for two reasons. Uh, the first one is, you know, our experience encountering Du Bois. Uh, I graduated from Johns Hopkins, as uh, Julian mentioned, and I think I got good training, but during my training, I never heard of Du Bois. I just encountered Du Bois by chance because my first job was a postdoc at Yuma Amherst and the library there houses the Du Bois archives and it's named after Du Bois. So I was just curious to, to see who Du Bois was. And I realized that, you know, I should have read this person in graduate school. So uh, I started teaching Du Bois slowly and eventually, you know, to, first to undergraduates, then to graduates. And, you know, eventually all that after many years, uh, you know, ended in writing this book. But so uh, my students don't get the same experience I get. You know, we wrote this book so young students and not so young scholars get, uh, you know, a tool to learn about Du Bois. And, you know, today I'm happy to say that I teach a seminar on Du Bois and I start my 
classical sociological theory course with Du Bois. So, you know, all my students today learn Du Bois. So, you know, they don't go through the same experience I went. The second reason, and uh, we are going to get to this at the end of the talk, is what are the implications of Du Bois for today's sociology? How reading Du Bois seriously forces us to rethink sociology. So I'll uh, pass the, the floor to Carida now. Hi, everybody. Um, before I start with my journey and encounter with Du Bois, I just wanna uh, reiterate our gratitude uh, Professor Go for inviting us to come and share our book and speak in this wonderful series. Um, we've been looking forward to this for quite some time. So uh, uh, big hugs, e-hugs to you. Um, so I'll start off by just sharing my encounter with Du Bois. And we always start our talk off like this in this reflexive moment. So we also invite you um, in the audience to think about how you first encountered Du Bois, if you have uh, in, in your curriculum. So for me, it was not until my second year of graduate school. And it was a moment that was both um, intellectually exciting and um, uh, in a way, uh, a way that, that, in a way that saved me. Um, but also in a way that was devastating. See, cause I was in, I went to graduate school at Brown. Uh, Jose wasn't yet my dissertation advisor. He would soon become that. And I was one of those graduate students who took a little time to find my way in the discipline of sociology, especially in my first year. And by my second year, I was feeling um, that although I was able to comprehend the, the text that we were reading, both theoretically and empirically, I still didn't find stakes, right? What, is the, what does this research mean to me? Why did I really come to this discipline and what will I be able to do with it once I get out of graduate school? So I was having a bit of an existential moment, which is totally normal as, as you go through graduate school. And um, it was not in my sociology courses. I ended up taking an elective course in the Department of Africana Studies at Brown with Professor Tony Bogues. It was in that class that he assigned the souls of black folk. And that book saved my life. It stimulated me. It spoke to my black soul um, and just lit a fire under me because I said, if this uh, book, you know, is a reflection of what's possible uh, in academia, then, you know, I, I want to be able to write like this, uh, as well as theorize in this way that's so beautiful um, um, and, and piercing. Uh, you can imagine my surprise, so I say partially devastating, when I found out that Du Bois was himself a sociologist, and not just a sociologist, but one who um, really helped to shape the architecture of our discipline, or at least the path that our discipline could have taken, um, you know, in a, in a more mainstream way when he was alive. Um, so I was devastated because I never had been assigned Du Bois on any of my syllabi in my sociology department. He didn't come up, you know, and I really felt like I was being robbed of a part of my education that should have been at the center let alone at the margins, it wasn't even there. It was like non-existent. So from there, I um, continued reading as much of Du Bois' work as I possibly could. And that's when I um, had the fortunate encounter with having a conversation about him with Jose. And Jose expressed that he too uh, had this lingering curiosity and admiration for W.E.B. Du Bois. And from there, uh, he invited me to co-author an article with him about Du Bois' uh, phenomenological theory of double consciousness, which was published in the Du Bois Review in 2015. And the rest was history. After we wrote that article, uh, we were invited to um, submit a book manuscript further elaborating Du Bois' uh, theoretical program uh, in sociology, and it culminated 
in this book here. So it has been a long journey, but one that has just been so nourishing um, and illuminating. We've learned so much about Du Bois. So we, uh, in this talk, intend to share a little bit of the um, major themes and arguments and findings that we present in the book. And we hope that you'll also pick up the book. Um, um, so we'll start there. So uh, Jose, I'll move to um, your first slides. Thank you, Carida. Um, yes, the, the, the first question that we ask ourselves, uh, you know, uh, Aldon Morris has established without, uh, you know, any doubt that Du Bois was one of the founders of sociology and the founder of American sociology. But the question, uh, we start from there and we ask ourselves, if he was the founder of sociology, what was his sociology? I mean, was he doing the same thing that we do now? Was he doing uh, the same thing that Chicago was doing, but earlier? I mean, and you know, it's, we are talking, we are supposedly at the University of Chicago, or at least at the University of Chicago Zoom. <laughs> uh, and our answer is no, that he was doing something different, that uh, he took a different road that sociology abandoned. And we, in the book, we try to assert what that uh, past is and what are its implications. So the first thing we say is that Du Bois was indeed the founder of uh, American scientific empirical sociology, but he was not only that, he was also a social theorist. I mean, uh, I don't know what is your experience, but many people would uh, say, okay, yeah, fine, Du Bois wrote the Philadelphia Negro. Okay, yes, yeah, he was a researcher. Yes, well, okay, fine. And what we say is, no, he was much more than that. He was the founder of, of a sociological approach. And at the center of his sociological approach was the color line, which for Du Bois was always global, was the, basically the characterization of the moment in which he li we, we live and he lives, and it's the same broad historical moment, uh, and we characterize it as racialized modernity. That at the center of modernity really is racism, the color line, and coloniality and colonialism. So this is important. His sociology was not a sociology of race, although he did uh, practice the sociology of race. It was not an urban sociology, although he engaged in urban sociology, but it was a critique of racialized modernity and of the many forms of racial and colonial capitalism. So that's the first two points that we make. Then we say, you know, uh, Du Bois sociology, I mean, we tend to think about, you know, ourselves as researchers, as scientists, as detached from our experiences. We need to keep a detached attitude. We, can, we need to keep, you know, look at, uh, at the world from a detached position. And Du Bois sociology was the opposite. Du Bois, du Bois started his theorization from lived experience. Double consciousness is a theory of racialized subjectivity, but it's also a, a theory of knowledge formation. And in Du Bois sociology, in Du Bois methodology, there is a central route to theorizing from experience. Another element of Du Bois uh, sociology was that it's rooted in history. Uh, by the 1920s, well, by, I mean, uh, by the late 1910s, Max Weber in Germany and at the same time, Robert Park at the University of Chicago were both engaged in the same methodological move, which is to detach sociology and history, make sociology and history two disciplines and make sociology a discipline that is not an historical discipline. Du Bois went com the complete opposite direction. For him, sociology was rooted in history, which is not to say that sociology is historical sociology. Those two things are very different. Um, what Du Bois asserted is that the present is historically constructed, that we need to understand the history of the social phenomena we analyze, and that we need to understand the historical characteristics of the present, the historicity of the present. And uh, the final point that we assert is that Du Bois sociology was global and relational. I mean, we are uh, trained to generalize while controlling for different variables. 
And Du Bois was always looking for heterogeneity of experiences and for diversity of experiences, but always linking those heterogeneous experiences to global historical social processes. So there is in Du Bois a methodology of connecting the local and the global and the specific and the general that is very different from what most departments train our sociologists, our young sociologists today. So Du Bois was a social theorist, his, his sociology, his theoretical approach is a critique of racialized modernity. His method is rooted in lived experience in history and in linking the global and the, and the local while accounting for diversity and the multiplicity of experiences. So very broadly, this is how we characterize uh, Du Bois sociology. And now I return the floor to Carida. Okay, so um, I want to take a little time um, here to just talk about Du Bois's evolving program. So this is a, a entire chapter that we take up in the book, chapter four. Um, and what's important about this here and why we um, uh, center it in the talk is to just uh, re-emphasize the fact that Du Bois lived a very long life and one in which for most of his long life, he was uh, uh, producing scholarship. So he was born in 1868, just three years after the 14th Amendment was ratified at the um, uh, uh, close of the Civil War. And he lived until 1963. So in one lifetime, Du Bois uh, lived through the Reconstruction era, two world wars, right? and through the uh, main arc of the American Civil Rights Movement, including many other uh, uh, macro global transformations and conflicts. Um, and all of those events shaped Du Bois, uh, both as a, as a person and an intellectual, and that's reflected in his scholarship. So often uh, today, you know, for those departments that do teach Du Bois, uh, um, you know, we, we credit them deeply, but uh, we still tend to see in the discipline of sociology, at least, uh, to see Du Bois's work um, uh, kind of uh, captured within souls of Black folk. You might see a little Philadelphia Negro, all right, and then uh, perhaps some Black Reconstruction. And while those three texts are uh, 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 super important and uh, uh, really uh, hallmarks of Du Bois' sc scholarship, they only reflect a tiny portion of his life's work. So what we did in this um, in in our book was really work to synthesize Du Bois's oeuvre, right? But to do so um, in a way that reflected these different eras of his evolving thought to really keep track of that. And why that was important, as I mentioned, so not only did he have this long life, uh, Du Bois first started uh, uh, publishing, you know, um, you know, formal academic scholarship in the 1890s, right? And he continued publishing all the way through the late 1950s. So that's almost 75 years of scholarship, okay? Over 26 books. And you know, just untold articles, essays, and periodicals. So it is uh, nearly impossible to keep up with, you know, uh, uh, managing his oeuvre to, to uh, even approach it in a systematic way. So I'll talk a little bit about a few of these eras. The first was um, this era where Du Bois really held on to the idea of science, truth, and focusing on what uh, was colloquial colloquially called at the time the Negro problem. Um, this was the period where Du Bois is, uh, you know, just graduating with his PhD from Harvard, just coming back from uh, Germany during his time doing uh, some additional graduate work at the University of Berlin. And Du Bois really believed that uh, it, um, racism and prejudice were both um, uh, uh, caused by ignorance, right? So if he were able to prove through scientific methods, through social scientific methods, that um, you know there was no scientific 
truth to racial inferiority of African Americans or people of color around the world, then the white world would wake up and say, oh, well, we just didn't know. But now that we know better, we'll do better. Uh, so this was a very short lived period of his career, but one in which he uh, produced prolific scholarship. So uh, I'm sure there are texts that you uh, are thinking of during this time, but I wanna take us to uh, a few things that he did during this period that you might not know about. Um, so here's a photo of Du Bois uh, from back in 1901, um, uh, where he was, uh, he participated at the Paris World's Fair. Uh, he um, uh, co-curated an exhibition called The American Negro for the World's Fair, um, where he uh, did something a bit um, unconventional. The World's Fair, as you know, is set up to showcase the advances in uh, technology, uh, industrialism, and as they would call it back then, civilization of uh, various nation states around the world. So the United States would send uh, groups to represent uh, uh, the US uh, around different facets. So uh, Du Bois's group was uh, sent on behalf of, of the United States. And there he, uh, co-curated an, an exhibition of 363 photographs of African Americans, primarily from Atlanta, Georgia, just being their black selves. And during and in that photo exhibition, he did not uh, put any uh, signage or explanation. He just displayed, uh, you know, with this title uh, uh, of American African Americans from Atlanta, Georgia. He also included uh, graphs of demographic data showing the uh, uh, social and economic conditions of African Americans over time from emancipation to uh, his present day of, of 1900. Um, and this World's Fair uh, was uh, one of the most visited World's Fair in history, uh, having um, received uh, 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 an estimated 55 million viewers over the course of its one year showing, right? So at this debut, um, at this fair, Du Bois's group won first prize for this exhibition. So can you imagine he used demographic data, right? Um, and presented it in such a beautiful way that he was able to capture the attention of millions of viewers millions of lay people. So here are just two examples of the charts um, and, and infographics that Du Bois created for this World's Fair. Uh, he produced the art himself. Um, isn't it fantastic? And here are examples of the types of photos that he took, I mean, that he presented. He uh, pulled these photos from one local photo shop in Atlanta, Georgia, that would take um, uh, pictures of uh, middle class, primarily middle class African Americans in Atlanta. And as you can imagine, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, this was really um, uh, a luxury because the, the uh, camera as we know it was just, uh, just hitting the scene. So imagine the counter narrative that Du Bois was articulating and advancing through these images and through those statistics without even uh, 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 saying a word, right? Without even having to describe what it was that he was trying to convey. It was during this time that Du Bois also produced two texts that uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with. Uh, the Philadelphia Negro, which was published in 1897, 98. Uh, du Bois was commissioned to carry out that study by a philanthropic organization in Philadelphia, um, and he was hosted uh, quite rudely by the University of Pennsylvania. They hosted him but didn't give him an office or any of the uh, uh, accoutrements that a visiting faculty member should have had, uh, but yet and still he was able to produce uh, this amazing empirical uh, uh, work of urban sociology. This was also the period in which Du Bois produced The Souls of Black Folk, this book that changed my life. Um, but this was early Du Bois. So he was really looking for uh, answers, right? Through uh, pure empirical science, um, social science. Um, and he felt like the, the data, 
the facts and the findings alone would be enough to uproot uh, the systemic racism and anti-Black racism that was, uh, that's a hallmark feature of uh, the US and abroad. So uh, it didn't take Du Bois long to realize that that wasn't gonna work at all, right? And he had to uh, rethink his, his approach. Um, um, and this is where this period between 1910 and 1928 when he leaves his made first major academic post uh, that he held at Atlanta University uh, uh, since 1897. So he had a, a little bit of experience under his belt. Um, uh, he left Atlanta University in 1909 to go join the NAACP, uh, specifically as the the first for uh, the Crisis Magazine, which is one of the, uh, a magazine that's still in publication now, but during Du Bois's tenure as editor, it was one of the most widely circulated uh, uh, black uh, magazines or periodicals of uh, the early 20th century. And it was during this time that Du Bois really embraced um, uh, uh, pragmatism, this notion of propaganda and pan-Africanism. So uh, while uh, uh, um, uh, scholars have uh, argued that du, du Bois have, has long been a global theorist, we make that argument too in our book, um, you really start seeing him activate and animate that in his, uh, not only his scholarship, but his organizing and activism in this era between 1910, uh, beginning in 1910. Where we say uh, 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 propaganda, that doesn't, uh, I don't want you to take that uh, for the pejorative connotation that it uh, bears today. Uh, and this time using that word propaganda really meant uh, propagating an idea. How do you, what are the mediums uh, through which ideas get uh, uh, spread and picked up into a, a broader, you know, um, um, into broader society beyond your, your group, right? So beyond uh, just an intellectual audience, Du Bois understood the importance of reaching uh, with the masses. And he picked back up on the pragmatism that he had learned uh, um, and was first introduced to during his time at Harvard while he was a student of William James and uh, 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 the early members of the Metaphor Club. So uh, here's a photo of uh, Du Bois and many of his colleagues at the NAACP headquarters in New York City um, uh, during its founding. And uh, the NAACP at, at its outset was a, a multiracial organization uh, that uh, had a um, you know, illustrious board of intelligentsia uh, across across fields and disciplines. So Du Bois joined that team and he was, again, the sole edit editor of the crisis. While he's known for his work with the crisis, Du Bois did a whole bunch of other, um, 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 uh, we'll call them uh, uh, artistic expressions during this time. So I'll point out a few uh, just for uh, sake of time. So while he was editor of the crisis, Du Bois also founded one of the first uh, uh, black playhouses in uh, New York City. He called it the Krigwa Players. Um, and this theater was located where what is now um, the Schomburg Center for the study of black, uh, black uh, culture and history, uh, which is a part of the New York Public Library system. It was in the basement of that building. And um, while the uh, theater did not last very long, only about a year and a half, uh, this was an idea that Du Bois put forth to produce plays that took up subject matter that he said would be for us, by us, and about us. That was the mandate of the Krigwa players. And he had uh, constituted a board of, uh, you know, again, illustrious Harlem Renaissance thinkers, such as Zora Neale Hurston and uh, the painter Aaron Douglas. Here's an image of a pageant that Du Bois uh, wrote and produced called the, the Star of Ethiopia. Uh, he wrote this uh, uh, pageant uh, 
Dur uh, around the time when he uh, first start became the editor of the crisis but couldn't find a venue to put it on at um, and just by chance during the uh, 50th anniversary of the emancipation proclamation new york state governor was looking for something to um, do to to highlight that that moment and du bois submitted this uh this pageant which was hosted first in new york uh, had to be hosted in a baseball stadium and then traveled the country and was also put in Philadelphia, DC and Los Angeles. What is uh, magnificent about this pageant was not only its size. Uh, so you see some of the actors here, um, there were up to 200 live actors that will perform this pageant. That's why it had to be performed in stadiums. It would draw audiences between 10 and 15,000 people a clip, right? Uh, but the subject matter of this pageant was pre-colonial African history uh, going uh, to through the Middle Passage to the Americas, telling this story of uh, um, uh, uh, becoming African American through this experience, this um, uh, Pan African experience. So, uh, so this this pageant was wildly um, meaningful and impactful and and um, um, well viewed. And lastly, during this era, I have to point this out, for a year and a half, Du Bois also produced uh, and ran a children's book that was an offshoot of the crisis magazine called The Brownies Book. Um, and here he used a term that uh, I'd, I'd not seen before in that period where he says this is for children of color for children under the sun. Um, and that is how he would title um, the inside of each issue of the Brownies book. It came out monthly. Um, and for this, he would solicit uh, black artists, writers, playwrights, musicians to submit a piece of their best work to remind uh, black and brown children around the world that they are thought about and loved. So these are just a sample this is not you know, the, a full representation, but just a sample of the types of mediums that Du Bois drew on to um, express his sociology uh, during this era. So I won't spend much time on the last two eras. We hope you'll pick up the book, but I wanna just point them out. So uh, uh, next, uh, you know, he, here in 1928, we, Du Bois uh, has a serious encounter with Marx and really starts to uh, um, develop a more robust appreciation and understanding of uh, what we call racial and colonial capitalism, but really understanding that um, you know, there is no analysis of race and racism without an, a, a deep analysis of uh, class and capitalism and how those things uh, uh, work constitutively. Um, and he put that not only into his research, but into his practice. Um, and the work that would be the hallmark of this period uh, is Black Reconstruction in America. And if you've not had the opportunity to read that text, we strongly encourage you to do so. Um, it will uh, reveal a lot about what we're experiencing in the world today. Um, um, and I know it's 700 pages, but most of us are still kind of, kind of in the house. So it's a good time to, to get that black reconstruction under your belt if, if you have. And lastly, we see this like deep turn to Pan-Africanism. While Du Bois never dropped it, uh, you know, the fifth Pan-African Congress was held in 1945. And this was an event that was not led by Du Bois nor um, you know, planned by him, but it was one in which the, a new generation of uh, uh, diasporic uh, African and Pan-African thinkers and leaders uh, came together to kind of uh, inaugurate and re revive the uh, Pan-African Congress. And here they gave Du Bois his flowers and really poured out a lot of love and thanks for being an inspiration for this you know, uh, organization that uh, mobilized uh, uh, what then became, what soon became uh, your, your um, you know, the, the fall of colonialism in its traditional form in the continent of Africa. And Du Bois also formally uh, joins the Socialist Party for, for a quick minute. So these are, uh, um, this kind of encapsulates this period in his life. 
I'll end with this photo of Du Bois and Paul Robeson at a World Peace Con Congress in Paris in 1949. Um, so we see here that Du Bois really um, um, continued not only did his thought evolve, but he just really broadened the spaces uh, where he uh, wanted to have impact and, and influence and be a part of a community. So uh, the World Peace Congress and that movement was so important to Du Bois um, that he became the president of uh, the Peace Information Center here in the United States. Um, uh, in 1949 and 1950, uh, that organization sent out peace grams to uh, uh, Americans uh, 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 around the country, uh, really promoting the denuclearization of, world, of all world powers, right? Uh, and that's what this organization was about. And for that, Du Bois and his colleagues were indicted by the United States federal government uh, uh, for you know, being suspected uh, foreign agents working for the Soviet Union. So for that, Du Bois at, at the age of 83 was indicted by the federal government, uh, dragged to court in handcuffs, uh, really became a social pariah amongst many of his um, uh, friends and colleagues. Um, and it was a turning point uh, for, for his platform as this premier you know, a pristine scholar, um, uh, an intellectual. Um, and very uh, quickly after Du Bois got his passport back, once that uh, case was, um, was dropped and, and he was absolved of these charges, Du Bois uh, left the United States for uh, Ghana at where he uh, spent the last years of his life in Accra under the, uh, at the invitation of uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, where Du Bois continued to work and write until his death. So I'll stop there, but the point of this whole section was, uh, please remember, we cannot hold Du Bois constant. We cannot hold his thought constant in one uh, space or time. So we encourage also uh, for you to experience as much as you can the range of uh, work, of his primary work in his oof. Um, so I'll pass it back to Jose. I was muted, I muted myself. Uh, can you put the, the last uh, slide? I, I'll reverse the talk, of the order of the slides. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, ultimately, how does all these, uh, you know, what? what's the relevance of all this for us today? I mean, you know, there is part of the story here, which is one of, if you want uh, epistemic justice or historical justice, which is to recover and put Du Bois in the right place where he deserves in the history of the discipline. But we believe that uh, reading Du Bois is about much more than that. That is important, but it's not only about that. What is at stake really is uh, changing how we practice sociology. It's about decolonizing sociological theory and decolonizing so sociological practices. So first of all, it is not, and I repeat, it is not about adding Du Bois to the sociological canon of Marx, Durkheim, and Weber. That's not the goal, not our goal, at least. I mean, the, that may be the goal of some people, not ours. Uh, it is really about provincializing the Eurocentric canon, which is, uh, which means understanding it as a product of a time and a place rather than a universal theory, and understanding how the characteristics of that time and place influence those uh, influence Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, and on the other hand, uh, bringing subaltern perspectives like the black radical tradition, the colonial theory, post-colonial theory into the center of sociological theory and practice. So we, we use in the book, this idea about bringing all the exiles together with Du Bois. Du Bois is not just, you know, the, you know, the point is not to bring Du Bois and canonize him, but Du Bois is the first among many that we want to bring into the center of the discipline. And, uh, you know, what does it mean in the practice of teaching? I, I, I am in conversation with many people, and there is much experimentation these days about how to teach theory. Uh, one way in which I'm doing it, and, you know, uh, I'm changing all the time is 
really starting with Du Bois and Anna Julia Cooper and reading Marx, Weber and Durkheim through Du Bois and Anna Julia Cooper, not in dialogue, because to me, it's not a dialogue of equals, but you know, understanding that we can learn from Marx, Weber and Durkheim, but we need to read them from a different perspective, not as universal theory, but from the angle of um, that, you know, thinkers like Anna Julia Cooper and Du Bois, in my case, others can choose others, the, the light that they provide, the angle that they provide. Um, and, uh, you know, there are others, and we heard a month ago, I think, uh, uh, Raywin Conner, who has done a, a great work in bringing, you know, in writing about a lot of these theories, and we need to learn them all. It's not just about learning Du Bois, but it's about doing the work of excavating many people that sociology has been really excluding. Uh, and, uh, it, and ultimately, the colonizing sociological theory is about expanding the theoretical and empirical practices of our discipline. I'll be talking a little about the theoretical practices, but the next stage is really translating these theoretical and methodological concerns into our research and also our publishing practices. And now I'll go to the, 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 the previous uh, Slides and this is our proposal for you know what is Du Boisian sociology could look today, and again you know the, the the way we see it is not just you know oh you know everything until now was wrong and we will bring Du Bois Du Boisian sociology. Is Du Boisian sociology is one effort to decolonize sociology and there are others there are there is you know critical race theory and this is the colonial theory and uh, there are postcolonial theorizations. There are many people coming from different quarters trying to rethink the theoretical and empirical practice of the discipline. And what we wanted to do is to provide one such contribution from the perspective on the voice. And again, the idea is not to say, well, now we don't read any more uh, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. We don't do anything of the things that we are doing. It's just expanding the limits of what is legitimate, expanding the things that are recognized as sociology. And in order to do that, we need to criticize the narrowness of what we do today as sociology. So we, we, no, <laughs> we propose a, a, a contemporary Du Bois in sociology based on four methodological pillars that are related to Du Bois work. One is uh, contextuality. We need to look at uh, social phenomena in its specificity and heterogeneity and in its context. It's not about looking for the general, it's not about extracting from the general, though we do want to look for the general, but only after we account for the many different things, uh, the many different manifestations of colonialism, of racial and colonial capitalism, of racism, of the color line, etc. And, and uh, so if contextuality is the first, relationality is the second. We don't anal analyze particular instances as separated. And again, um, Black Reconstruction is a great example of that. Du Bois analyzes American society and economy before the Civil War and during Reconstruction and after, but always putting the American case in its global context and relating it to empire and to imperialist attempts. So, uh, if we read uh, Du Bois, whether it's a uh, black reconstruction or the world in Africa, we see that methodology of accounting for the many multiple manifestations of the color line of colonialism, of the, the construction of race, while seeing at it in uh, relation to each other, but in, in, in forms of relations that are historically contingent, not given by uh, broad generalizations, but are forms of relations that need to be looked empirically in, his, in their historical contingency. And historicity is really the third element. And is uh, again, as I mentioned, it is rooting sociology in history, doing the opposite of what Bever and Park did in the 1920s, separating sociology from history, is understanding that the social sciences are historical, which does not mean doing historical sociology. People can still do historical sociology, but even if we are going to do urban sociology, we need to understand the historical moments. And that's what Du Bois does, for example, in the Philadelphia Negro. He starts with the history of the city and the history of migration and always understanding how 
the color line operates in Philadelphia as a historical contingent moment subject to uh, agency. And uh, in a famous article that went and published during uh, his life called Sociology Hesitant, Du Bois says, you know, the, the task of sociology is really to assert empirically to, to what extent we are subject to structure and local low light constraints and to what extent are a space for free will and, and what he calls chance, which is, you know, unscript social action. And uh, Du Bois wants to err on the side of what he calls chance as opposed to law, but he always said, you know, there, there is not a rule that tells us that it's always this way or the other. This we need to understand the, to look at in historical contingencies and look at different moments in time to what extent action is constrained and to what extent there is room for human creativity, human action, human innovating in the, the social historical structure. And the final element is a subaltern standpoint. And here uh, we agree with uh, Julian's uh, point in uh, his book on postcolonial uh, social, uh, so, um, social theory and postcolonial thought about the, the importance of perspectival realism of, of building a sociology with multiple perspectives. And we think that that should be the, the way sociology goes. But as a Du Boisian sociology, Du Boisian sociology ought to take a, a subaltern standpoint, which is a critical standpoint of racialized modernity, which understanding that there is not one subaltern standpoint, there are many subaltern standpoints, and that no, not every person in a subaltern position will see the same or will see critically. But the point uh, is, and as I was saying, uh, double consciousness is a theory of knowledge. Certain experiences make us more likely to be critical about certain things. They don't guarantee that. But what kind of criticism will develop will vary. And as a Du Boisian sociology, a Du Boisian is a sociology that embraces subaltern standpoints. While recognizing and embracing Julian's point about embracing perspective and realism for the whole discipline. But here we are talking about what is the approach that we are proposing as a Du Boisian approach. And we think that this methodology, these four pillars, methodological pillars, help us uh, overcome uh, what Julian identifies as the central problems of sociology, which is metrocentrism and analytical bifurcation. And it also uh, help us address what we see as a additional problems, which is the high historical character and a theoretical character of more, most mainstream sociology. So this is a, a methodology that may help us move forward with our empirical practices and the way we think about concrete problems in the way towards decolonizing sociology, in the way towards uh, going back to the path not taken, the, the voice path was a path not taken, which means really reflecting critically about the practice of our discipline in order to change them. So I think I'll stop there and we'll get your questions. Excellent, thank you so much for that uh, very enlightening uh, uh, presentation. Um, there's lots to talk about um, and, uh, and, and, and we're grateful that uh, you can spend a little bit more time with us uh, at, uh, to address questions. Um, so the way I'd like to do questions is to, to, to take questions um, in, in chat, just, just uh, type your name to me in chat and I'll put you in the queue and then I'll call on you um, and, and, and I'll help you get unmuted if, if that's a problem. Um, and then uh, you, can, you can ask your question. Um, we do have something of a tradition here at Chicago um, of letting the students go first. So uh, if you have a question and you're a student, send a message to me in chat um, and just let me know that you're a student and uh, you'll be among the first. So we'll, we'll go through the students' questions and then um, you know, even if you're uh, not a student, just send me a, your name in chat anyways and, and I'll put you in the queue and then we'll get to um, the non-student questions after that. Um, so uh, I first have, okay, there's lots, so we're gonna have to, uh, this is great. Um, I have uh, the first question here is um, going to be from um, Will Booz. Um, are you able to unmute yourself, Will? Um, yes, I believe so. Great, please go ahead. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Will. I'm a first year anthropology PhD student here at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, first of all, I just want to give a massive thank you to Professors Brown and Isigzon for this wonderful talk. Um, Professor Brown mentioned giving Du Bois his very deserved flowers, and I want to add that both of y'all deserve your flowers as well um, for the absolute gift of a book and for the ways that you so beautifully honor and advance Du Bois's theorization. Um, also, the glossary of key terms that y'all provide at the end of the book is itself just amazing, um, but I digress. Um, so with that, I'll get to my question, which is, um, I found it very incredibly generative to think with your framing of racialized modernity, of modernity being for Du Bois always already racialized. Um, but I'm curious how we might also consider modernity as an actively racializing discourse and how such a theoretical move would highlight how racial and racist formations are constantly being remade and perpetuated. Um, so with this, I'm wondering how words such as modernity, modern, and the spatialized racial construct of the modern city um, might themselves racialize. Um, and framing modernity as racializing is of course complementary with this framing of, of um, modernity as racialized, racialized modernity. Um, but I'm curious what you all have thought or are thinking about this. And again, thank you for your absolute gift of a book and this wonderful talk. And thank you to the organizers of the event as well. Um, I don't know, Carita, me, okay. <laughs> well, um, First of all, I mean, Du Bois doesn't talk about racialized modernity. That's, that is our reading of Du Bois. Uh, and uh, the way we get to that is uh, through uh, Quijano and the, the colonial school, but racial, you know, modernity, coloniality. Uh, and sociology a lot, you know, it is said, it is about, you know, the Marx, Weber, Durkheim is about the industry, you know, the, the, the manufacturing industrial capitalism is about the modern world, whether it's a, call it a, the division of labor or call it rationalizing or call it capitalism is about that moment in European history. And that's, uh, and, and that's the idea of modernity. Uh, by racialized modernity, we want to say, you know, that moment, what is, you know, if, uh, you know, Bever says it's rationality, if uh, the, the Durkheim says it's the division of labor, we say it's colonialism and racism that are at the center of what characterize our times. And here we go a little bit beyond Du Bois because uh, Du Bois uh, talks about, basically in his analysis about uh, the slave trade as the, the British develop it. And we, we said, you know, th this moment is more with Sylvia Winter 1492, the encounter and the creation of a certain way of looking at the world, a certain racialized looking at the world, which started then, it has many manifestations all over the world and over history, and we are still trapped in it. And it's a moment that maybe will end at some point. And again, we need in our understanding to understand the historicity of, of, uh, of the phenomena that we, that we investigate. You know, there may be a moment in which, you know, this kind of looking at the world changes, but in the meantime, it has changed many times, but we didn't abandon that basic distinction that puts the question of humanity and the human at the center. Uh, so as long as we are in that historical period, which is a very long and broad historical period, we call it you know, uh, racialized modernity. And the political economy of that is racial and colonial capitalism, yes? Again, it's capitalism, but understanding that capitalism was always based on racism and colonialism, that racism and colonialism was not, as Marx put it, a moment of uh, primitive accumulation, but that are central components of historical capitalism that change all the time and yet continue all the time in the organization of global relations, the economy, the, the forms of labor, etc. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that is where we come from with these two related ideas of uh, racialized modernity and racial and colonial capitalism. And I'll, I'll also add to that, Jose, um, uh, this is one reason why, you know, one of the pillars of Du Boisian sociology, both into his own sociological practice, but what we, um, you know, describe and invite uh, others to, to think about in the application its application in, in this contemporary moment is that this uh, uh, you know uh, lived experience, this phenomenological element of sociological uh, analysis is crucial, right? It is not ad hoc into the side or or nice to have. This 
um, uh, question of phenomenology, the uh, interiority of the self, the understanding of the self as a subject, right? This racialized subject, racializing, one that is always in the making. Uh, Jose, I mean, I was gonna say Jose, Du Bois, uh, Du Bois's uh, uh, theorization always left room for that. It is uh, infinitely capacious in that, uh, um, in that expectation for human, um, you know, he says sociology and, and sociology has it in, he argues that sociology is the study of human action, but I'll add to that, it's, the, it's also of the stuff of making, what makes the human. Um, so uh, under, this, uh, under these conditions of racialized modernity, what does, that, what does that mean? That we are always already racialized and racializing through all social relationships and processes and structures uh, and recognizing that and um, uh, identifying categories that are appropriate to really name what it is that's uh, setting us up in these sets of relations and categorizing ourselves is really uh, important. So to that, I just want to, uh, you know, add and emphasize how important this question of who are we matters to every sociological uh, question, uh, no matter what the topic or subfield. Yeah, and if I may add to that, thank you, very, uh, because you remind me something I want to say, it's like, you know, and this is not just, you know, the, the late more Marxist Du Bois, this is from the, in Du Bois from the beginning. If you read uh, the Philadelphia Negro, which sometimes, you know, is said, well, you know, this is the empirical Du Bois that the discipline recognizes, but if you read that book carefully, towards the end of it, uh, Du Bois asks, so what are the, I'm paraphrasing, yes, what are the problems of the Black community? And he says, on the one hand are the many problems that humanity has always suffered, poverty, exclusion, lack of jobs, lack of opportunities, etc. But more basically at the core of all that is the question, what he calls the question of questions. And the question of questions for Du Bois at the end of this massive empirical work in which he does statistics and interviews and da, 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 is who is man? Who gets to be called a man? So the, today, of course, we see that as limited and we rephrase it as the question of humanity, yes? But even at this most empirical moment for Du Bois, the question of the, the quality of people, but not the question of you know the, the, the health gap or the income gap, the question of, of the basic equality of who is recognized as a human is the center of all questions. Great, thank you. Um, so I think I'd like to take two at a time if we can. Um, I have a couple more students um, and, and I think if you could maybe just um, briefly introduce yourself and ask your question. Um, so uh, again, two at a time. Um, I'll first um, ask Shreya to uh, ask her question and then I'll ask Michael Theodore. So Shreya. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to thank Krita, Jose and uh, Professor Go for all of your work. Um, it sounds really corny to say that I like found home place within books, but like I really found a sense of belonging and I'm actually gonna be applying a PhD in sociology this fall largely because of the work that all of you do. So I, I wanted to start by saying thank you. Um, the question that I have um, has to do with the fact that I think um, all of your texts, while they obviously are, are talking about Du Bois and are talking about sociology, kind of go beyond that in terms of just like thinking about decolonizing our world in general and the ways that we produce knowledge. Um, and so I, I was curious to think about, um, like you, you give some suggestions about the ways that we can provincialize Eurocentric standpoint and canon um, within the classroom, but are there other ways that we can think about decolonizing the classroom space and the way that we learn about sociology in general? Great, and then um, Michael Theodore, please. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Theodore, as you <laughs> just said. Um, I'm a University of Chicago student uh, master's program in the social sciences. And I too am applying to PhD programs in the fall. And um, my question is this, um, before I got to the University of Chicago, I heard about the Chicago School of Sociology. I too learned about Du Bois late, very late. So I know your, intent, your, your intentions are not to place um, Du Bois in 
you know, waiver atmospheres and whatnot. That's not necessarily your, your intention, but there's still there's still honor and honoring somebody, like um, giving them their flowers. What is the best way for sociology programs across the country to honor Du Bois, giving him his flowers, even though he he's gone? There's still there's still sanctity to me in honoring people that deserve it. And Du Bois definitely deserve it. Thank you. And this is a great presentation, by the way. Um, awesome presentation. Kalia, okay, yeah, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I'm so moved. Uh, uh, Shreya and Michael and Will, thank you so much for, first of all, the generosity of your words and the way that you framed uh, um, you know, your, your introduction into this conversation. Uh, with so much kindness, I appreciate that. Um, and I want to uh, respond broadly uh, first by saying uh, we wrote this book to you and for you. So if you uh, pick it up, uh, the acknowledgments is to our graduate students defined broadly. So we meant for everyone who's going to come through these institutions and disciplines forevermore, like Jose didn't have this. I did not have this and boy, did we need it. So, and more. So uh, um, I'm, we're just glad to know that it, it re is resonating. Um, so I'm gonna make two brief remarks uh, that I hope speak to uh, your, your bo both of your questions and then pass it to Jose. So one thing that I think is um, uh, um, edifying here would be to refer to uh, du, du Bois's 19, 26 speech, The Criteria for Negro Art. He um, uh, orated this speech at an award ceremony for the Spingarin Award that was being given to Carter G. Woodson that year. And then it was printed uh, into text uh, and published, uh, and I forget which, it might, I, I forget which, uh, it was published in the crisis in 1926. And in this speech, Du Bois uh, makes a very uh, critical assessment. I would say this is his first like formal theorization of the production of knowledge, right? Uh, and those, the means of production. And there he's uh, really um, adamant, uh, and Shreya, I hope that this really speaks to your question about what is the role of the black artist? That's really the question that he uses to frame the whole talk. Um, and when he says black artists, he's talking about uh, if you are a writer, if you are producing painterly art, if you sing songs, if you are a poet, if you are a mama, if you are out there delivering a message, if you're a politician. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, he's, he's coming with this like really broad frame. And um, what he argues in a nutshell is, uh, number one, you cannot produce your work anticipating what your oppressor is thinking about or wanting to hear or will accept because already that will like always already compromise your work, your voice, uh, and that is uh, to not only the detriment but a, in a deep violation with your purpose. Uh, and bringing your gifts, your intellectual and artistic gifts to the world. Uh, so he makes that argument, but he also makes the argument that, um, and, and if you don't do it, guess who's gonna write your history? So you don't do it because for the clout, don't do it for the gram, don't do it for an award, don't do it for what the prestige of what program you're gonna get accepted into, you do it because that is the word that was put upon you to put out into this world. And you might not get your flowers in your lifetime, but you make, that's not your job. That's not your responsibility, right? Your, our responsibility is to put it out there. And it's like planting seeds. If you're a, a farmer, when you know that it's the season, you go plant your seeds. Do you go then stand over those seeds that you planted and say, well, when's the tree coming? No, you trust and believe that you planted it in fertile ground and walk away because you know that bounty is coming later. So he really did uh, 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 promulgate that 
Okay. And when we talk about, uh, uh, Michael, when you asked that question, how do we shout out to James Cleveland for that reference? How do we give Du Bois his flowers now? Um, read him. There are so many pieces of secondary literature about Du Bois, including our book. We want you to read those. We want you to read our book. We want you to read The Scholar Denied. There's a beautiful canon that is there to uh, 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 really enrich this conversation, especially in this moment. However, uh, how you really give him his flowers is to go back and read his primary texts. They are long. Some of them are wordy. Some of them you're gonna to have to read and reread to really get the message. But if you love them, take the time to, to read the, the, the primary text that he left. Uh, uh, and, and I think that that is the best way uh, to, to honor him. Um, and I'll also say to the professors in the room who do teach Du Bois, thank you so much. But a way that we all can give Du Bois our flowers is to find ways to incorporate him in meaningful ways in the syllabus, not just in the last week or the first week as a bookend, but really uh, putting Du Boisian sociology and conversation and sometimes at the forefront of, uh, you know, of, a, of, of our curricula. Yeah, um, I, I, I'll subscribe to all that. I'll just add a couple of things, you know, in terms of, you know, giving, Du Bois, his flowers, and other theories, their flowers, is just, you know, to read them, but not just to read them, you know, as dead letter, but read it as living letter, as, as a letter that talked to us today. And if you read Du Bois, the first thing you realize, if you read it long enough, is that he changes his mind all the time, as Carida showed through when she went through the, you know, public sociology career of Du Bois. So the question is, you know, uh, not, read, not, not just read him, but just think with him about our present. Uh, and, and with him and with others. And the, the point is, you know, Du Bois was a genius and we, we, we respect him and love his work and we want to bring him, but we need to, un to understand he was one of many cast outs. It's not just Du Bois, it's Fanon, it's, uh, you know, Anna Julia Cooper, it's Stuart Hall, it's many people. Um, and uh, regarding the, the question about decolonization that Shria mentioned, I mean, it's really thinking, of, I mean, we really need to think, to change the ways we think, because, you know, you, you said you, were, you are going to apply uh, next year to, you know, a, a PhD program, but, you know, the, the, what happens in, in, you know, for example, in publishing, and many people have different experience, but, if you send an article to a major journal about inequalities in the school of Chicago, you know, they will re revise your methodology, but nobody will, you know, ask you what's the relevance of Chicago. If you send an article about, you know, uh, inequalities in the schools of uh, Rio de Janeiro, they will ask you to justify the theoretical relevance of, uh, so we need to break that provinciality. Uh, we need to understand that the US case is an important one, but you know, it's one among many and we need to understand the historical specificities of the US that make it similar to other cases and different. And what are the contingencies that make them similar and different? And what are the power relations? Um, I mean, uh, we still use in uh, studies of uh, mobility, you know, the, a, a model created in Wisconsin in the fifties among, you know, white, people, uh, you know, yeah, sure, that may have been good for Wisconsin in the 50s among, you know, uh, but, but, you know, that we universalize as if it applies everywhere. And the point that uh, we, we are trying to say is we need to, uh, to, to connect, to the, the methodology is about understanding the specificity and the contingency in its relations to other broad historical processes and understanding that in the context of racism and colonialism as the, uh, you know, key processes that characterize our modern times. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take some more. We still have a, a, a list here um, and I'll take two at a time again. Um, can I ask Anu McKinde to ask a question and then Daniel Luna. So Anu. 
Hi, um, I'm Anu. I'm currently a fourth year student at the University of Ottawa. Um, and I wanted to just say thank you so much to both of you for your words. Um, I think for a long time, I've really identified with sociology and I was fortunate enough this year to be able to read a chapter of Dubois in one of my classes. Um, and I really relate to what you said um, about wishing you had it sooner, even though I read it quite early compared to some people. Um, but I enjoyed when you guys talked about um, propagating of ideas. And I was wondering if Dubois said anything or wrote anything about ineffective ways of sharing ideas, not in um, a negative way, but maybe lessons that can be learned um, in our current world like there's Instagram, so many different news outlets of how people share news, um, but really how can we share theory, decolonial theory with other people um, in a way that's easy to understand based on what he wrote about. Great, thank you. And Daniel, Luna, are you still there? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm with my baby here. Um, I'm a PhD student also working on the colonial theory uh, and uh, thank you for the talk. I'm looking forward to read the book. But I'm, I'm specifically interested also in, in your experiments or experience teaching the students a uh, non-canonical authors, right? Because I'm also in agreement with you that it's not simply to put them at the end of the syllabus or, or adding them in this kind of like extra way. But when, I, I want to learn more. Maybe if you could illustrate briefly how you try to do these new ways of challenging the canon and producing these critical experiences in the students, because I'm also interested into incorporating that in my own teaching, right? Since political theory is also really Western centric as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Creator or Jose? Um, uh, you want to start to take it or? Uh, sure. Uh, so I'll first respond to Anu. Um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Okay, so I think that the question that you asked is the question that Du Bois would be uh, challenging himself to respond to if, if he were alive today. Uh, and I think that many of his contemporaries would be doing the same. It's one thing to, you know, part of our process uh, in becoming uh, scholars and intellectuals is, you know, absorbing uh, knowledge, right? And uh, many of us are socialized to do that through absorbing a canon, being able to demonstrate that you understand that. But the leap is really to then become a producer of knowledge producer of knowledge and uh, by way of your own research, but always as a teacher. At the end of the day, we're teachers, we're educators. So it is to uh, amplify and break new ground with our own research, but to always be in a space of, in relationship with publics, various publics to, uh, uh, you know, as you use and as Du Bois used there to propagate uh, knowledge and information. And what Du Bois was really, um, keen about was that different audiences consume information in different ways. So instead of trying to shove journal peer reviewed journal articles down folks uh, throats, he said, okay, uh, magazines are really popular. That that was the uh, main way that everyday people, working class people, right? Uh, uh, could, got consumed uh, knowledge or a readerly public. So that's the venue through which he, uh, you know, started to target a lot of his work. And if you, I'll use the crisis as an example, but you can go through many of these forms, whether they were his plays or uh, collaborations that he did with poet, poets and, um, and visual artists, he was always regurgitating, repackaging, right? His theories that you see in, so his theory of double consciousness, the arguments that he's making about race and class under this uh, racialized modernity in uh, uh, Black Reconstruction, he's breaking those concepts and arguments down and putting them in novels, in short stories, in op-eds, and disseminating right, that, that, that knowledge in different mediums. And I think that uh, that is 
uh, uh, I, I'm so happy that you asked that question because I, I take it as a challenge and one that we can all always ask ourselves, hmm, I wrote this paper for class uh, and I'm really proud of it. How, what, can, what else can I do with it? You know, and I don't know, maybe you, I'm not on Instagram because I don't know how to, I'm, too, I'm old, I don't know how to work it, but like, you know, whatever mediums you are on um, and where you, where you are in community with folks, there are opportunities there to uh, uh, translate, translate what you know, uh, each one teach one, because we're all in relationship with one another. Yeah. I'll, I'll answer the second question, the, the question about teaching. And I think there is a lot of experimenting these days. I don't think anybody has the answer about how to do it. Uh, we are all trying new things and listening and learning from each other. Uh, and the, the, the way I do it is one, I, I teach a, a, a whole seminar on Du Bois, but the, the way I do it is I teach uh, Du Bois and I teach other thinkers of his time and contemporaries uh, and, and, and look at, you know, how Du Bois is different or uh, how, what, what reading Du Bois gives us. I mean, in that seminar, we read part that nobody else read, but in order to contrast, you know, what was the Atlanta school and the Chicago school, you really need to understand what the Chicago school was about. Uh, and how the Atlanta school was different, uh, because if not, you're, you, you end up thinking, oh, well, you know, Du Bois just was the first of doing what Park did later, but not as good. And it's not at all that. Uh, and I also uh, read Du Bois uh, uh, together with contemporary uh, thinkers uh, to see, you know, what we can learn from Du Bois and how we can combine ideas. We read Julian's book and we read other books. <laughs> So, uh, so that's one thing I do. Another thing I do, I, I teach a classical theory course and I start with Du Bois and Anna Julia Cooper. And that, you know, I don't put them at the end, like, you know, the diversity week. I start with both of them and I said, you know, this is the, uh, the, the, the prism through which we are going to look at theory. And then we read, you know, Marx and Weber, but we read them through the prism of the questions raised by uh, Du Bois and Anna Julia Cooper. And it's a completely different reading. Uh, so it's not like you don't read, uh, you know, the, the canon, but you read it from a different perspective. And other people are doing different things, you know, it, it's a time of experimentation and innovation. I don't claim to have, you know, the ultimate answer to your question. I just encourage you to talk to people about what they are doing and find your own way and communicate with the rest of us about what you do. And I can also add to that, Jose, um, and this goes back to something that you said um, in your uh, previous remarks, and it's about um, uh, this question of, of relevance and importance, right? Um, because when I, I think about that question, I really think about how, uh, how do, when we say uh, decolonize the curricula or the syllabus, we're also talking about uh, specifically uh, this, con th this topic of whiteness, so how do we address or, or redress the whiteness of the curricula? How do we redress the Euro-American centrism of the curricula? And um, um, for me, the question uh, really starts with the presuppositions that you even that you come to before you even pen the first text or the order of the readings for the syllabus. And that is uh, uh, just presupposing that you know what is you know how what is what is your category is the category human is the category the nation state is the ca category a white american man right because that is the the presupposition for if one is to you know not think about those things that's the default right it, if if you just look historically through if you, we were to look at syllabi as text so uh just the idea that uh you know um uh different groups with different uh, uh, racialized experiences coming from different parts of the world and relating at always with one another through this place, this invented place called the United States of America, right? How does that uh, manifest itself? When we interrogate our presuppositions, I think that that really uh, invites a really exciting set of possibilities and arrangements for a syllabi that would not uh, be apparent 
to us in the first place. Um, um, and, and this really made me think a lot about like in writing my, my dissertation book, Gone Home, um, that was the question for me. I thought that the group that I studied were interesting and important enough to study them as a question. It is not a comparative study of African-Americans vis-a-vis whites, which, you know, which uh, you know, I might've been, uh, incur- which I was encouraged to do early on when I was thinking about the research. Um, so this, but it was a political decision as much as it was an empirical one in that, you know, at the outset, I was making a statement, even though it wasn't explicit, that this group is important enough on its own to be the interesting and important without some, you know, uh, without needing to bring in uh, the experiences of white Americans just to make my study relevant. Now that might've been important if the question was different, but it didn't necessitate it and I didn't do it. I wrote a sociology book with no white people in it. Yeah. But, you know, so those are choices uh, that, that can have a very powerful uh, empirical and theoretical implications. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We have a, a little bit of time left and we have a couple more questions. Um, so we'll, we'll get to those. And then if we have a few more minutes, maybe I'll throw one in there as well and take advantage of my uh, pull the organizer's prerogative. Um, so the first one is from Juho. I'm going to put it here in the chat because he says his internet's not working. Um, uh, many thanks, he says, um, as we know from later post-colonial critique, like those of Manuela Boacha and many others, especially those considering Eurasian empires about attempts at provincialization, that a perspective even marginal or subaltern from the Atlantic empires only its, in its critique risks reproducing the epistemic limits that Eurocentrism had historically constructed and constituted. So could you say a little bit about if, if and how Du Bois helps us provincialize from an inter-imperial historical, not just analytically global perspective. Thank you. Um, and then we have a question from um, Megan Wilson. If you can in- say hello, please, Megan, and ask your question. Hi, hi, Jose, hi, Carita. Um, Carita, you kind of got at it. I, I wanted to speak to, I wanted you to speak to how you both use a Du Boisian sociology in your own work now, uh, because going home, I think for me as an urbanist, and like studying Detroit made me rethink how to like think through political science, right? Um, and so I would love to think how you all are doing that in your cur- in the current iterations of your work. Uh, and then honestly, like how much pushback do you get when you do it, right? Um, because in political science, I we have not reached the point where we are quite there and I'm getting a lot of pushback. And so I just kind of want to know how you're able to do that work in the research part of it and telling those stories. I don't know if that was a clear question, but. Jose, I'm gonna let you go first. Okay, well, um, to Juho's question, which uh, is a question that uh, was (laughs) discussed many times uh, at Brown, um, the, the point is this, um, when we say uh, we are talking about racialized modernity and racial and colonial capitalism and it's based on the creation of the Atlantic world, we are not saying that that exhausts all histories. We are saying that the historical world system in which we live is centered around that. That gives it the, its central dynamics. And at the same time, are other histories going on which are uh, related in different ways to that. So the point is not to say, well, you know, now we need to see the history of other empires and other regions always through this light, but it is to say that uh, let's think how these dynamics interact in different parts of the world, understanding that they interact with local histories and that without presuming what is the answer to that, but uh, looking at it empirically. Now, uh, does that center the Atlantic world? Yes, to some extent, but uh, we could say the argument is that historically 
the, the modern world system was constructed around and through the processes that developed around the, the Atlantic world, uh, which doesn't mean that that's the only story or the only story that we can tell or the only story going on. Um, I know, Juho, that you think differently. So, I mean, this is not a new conversation, but that's the answer to your question. Uh, uh, regarding the second question, pushback, uh, I mean, uh, I think it's, it's too early to tell. I think that there is a lot of pushing forward and there will be pushback. Uh, I just tell a short story. Uh, how do I apply all this? So I'm, uh, you know, looking. At, I'm writing with a uh, with a former student uh, some some article about uh, class and race in the United States, which is a quantitative article. But to do it in the Du Bois and Bain, we are looking it uh, through the uh, through the angle of uh, racial and colonial capitalism and uh, using. Uh, the analysis of Du Bois in Black Reconstruction, but at the same time, it's a quantitative article that criticizes the quantitative frame, but at the same time tries to show what we can do. Anyway, we sent it to a journal, one of the main journals of the discipline, not the Chicago Journal, not the AJS. And, uh, you know, uh, we got two reviewers, and uh, it's interesting about pushback. One reviewer was furious. I mean, the article was rejected, and when I read it again, yes, it was justly rejected because we did a sloppy work. Uh, I mean, we send it too fast, which is a mistake that you, we commonly make. But it was a visceral reaction from the reviewer calling our work ideology and trashing it without even reading it. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we are likely to get a lot of pushback and a lot of visceral reactions from you know anonymous reviewers and anonymity always gets the worst in everybody yes uh, and some non anonymous reviewers and you know i always say that the movement that, that the moment we are living right now it's a kind of a gramscian war of positions in which we are uh, struggling to define the common sense and you know yes that we are going to get pushed back and some people are going to get very angry and you know, uh, react viscerally even behind the clock of anonymity or not. Uh, but uh, you know, I believe in sociology. I believe that sociology has something to say that the particular way in which sociology addresses empirical phenomena through institutional structural analysis and theory is a unique way. It's not better or worse than the humanities or other sciences, but it's a unique way that I love and I think it has something to contribute. So it's, it's something that is worth for me struggling for. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, we are against uh, institutional inertias and the institu hard, you know, uh, f beliefs that are strongly held. And, you know, uh, just to use a Bavarian term, uh, the disciplines are much more traditional than they, in their behavior than they like to, to, to think. Uh, about themselves. So, yeah, so, so, it, it, you know, do, as Carida was saying, Du Bois at the beginning thought that just providing the white elites with uh, scientific information will change their mind, and he very soon realized that, that was not the case. So, I'm under no illusion that providing, uh, you know, the, the establishment of the disciplines with this material will change their mind. It is a kind of cultural struggle and, you know, yes, there will be moments in which uh, it's going to be unpleasant. Great. I, I couldn't help. I just can't help. I know, Frida, you can go, but Jose, I can't help but chime in here because the letter that you got <laughs> on this paper, that critical letter, it sounds like basically every letter I've ever had my whole 30 year career. So uh, I'm with you. I'm with you, brother. Um, Carita, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, uh, really briefly, your freedom and your liberation is not in the institution, so don't be looking there for it. And when I say the institution, I also mean the whole apparatus. So that's the publishing industry, the awards, the, all of this. Uh, so all of those things are a distraction. Rely on your training. Rely on your intellectualism that goes beyond what you've just been taught, but you know, you're know you putting your experiences, your mind, your uh, you know, um, uh, gifts 
into this and um, uh, going back to that criteria of Negro art essay, uh, uh, write it anyway and make it fire. Great, thank you. Um, Angie, did you have a question, the last one? We have like a, another minute or two. Yes, thank you, uh, Carita, Jose. Um, nice to see you both. Um, it wasn't so much a question except like a sort of comment, I guess, on some of the questions that had gone before. And I mean, I think one of the things that I feel like um, you guys have done so powerfully um, and, and, you know, in terms of creating space for this kind of work is to do the Du Boisian move of creating your own organs of communication, right? Like, you know, through the Du Boisian Scholars Network, but what, like Julian also, um, his journal, Political Power and Social Theory, that has provided these great platforms, you know, like, as again, like Du Bois did for Crisis Magazine, um, where you could put out this kind of, you know, genre bending or, you know, sort of discipline defying work and have it get judged on its own terms, right? You know, speaking as itself for itself, right? Without sort of being shackled to constantly having to take into account some kind of white sociological perspective, you know, and always addressing itself in, the, in that grammar and to that grammar. So, you know, I mean, I just want to applaud you guys for, for doing that sort of counterinsurgency work. And, um, you know, I mean, perhaps this is not the forum for it, but, um, you know, I would love to talk more about what you're plans are for the future uh, for continuing that kind of uh, war of position work. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe an ASA section on Du Boisian sociology or something like that, although that might end up ghettoizing it, you know, just just sort of curious about that. Um, and, and so I guess that is a question there. And, and so the second thing I was going to say was like, I just, you know, in terms of Juho's comment, I think one of the things that's really interesting about Du Bois, about du Bois is that, you know, his critiques don't come through theory also. It's like, it's always centering the subjectivity of the subaltern uh, subject, right? And, you know, you see it in like, you know, I was sort of thinking about it the other day, like he talks about the souls of black folk, right? Like sociology never talks about the souls, about the interiority, right? And like, it's from that interiority and taking that seriously, not as a sort of like data point for theory, but as a sort of sort of lived experience that you push to question the limits of theory, right? And I mean, I think that if you have concerns or, you know, concerns we have about replicating the sort of epistemic, you know, the sort of Foucault talks about that, right? You know, sort of replicating the sort of epistemic errors by simply being a sort of negative position, you know, against, you know, um, you know sort of a Eurocentric vision. It's like in our experiences, our experiences in and of themselves as, you know, racialized BIPOC folk, like, exceed these theories and their the, the grounds on which they stand right and you know um i think about you know i i'm, I'm not like fully read up on like afro pessimist stuff but you know for example like you know like work that's sort of coming out of afro pessimist perspectives like you know sort of uh you know talk about you know sort of the just the history of like black domination and bring like serious questions to like theories of like the liberal the western liberal subject in political theory right and like that's again, coming out of history, right? History and data, right? Of the lived experiences of, of, of people. So anyway, that's what I was gonna say, but thanks. Thank you so much for all your work and thanks for this, Julian. Thanks, um, Carita, Jose, you wanna close us out with a word or two? Yeah. I will, oh, I'll just end with a, a deep gratitude uh, and well wishes to everybody in this space. Uh, for those of us who were fortunate enough to make it through this pandemic that is still ongoing, uh, we are scholars, we are academics. This is a place of, of work for us. And for many, it, it exceeds that category, but we are all so much more. And, you know, just please don't forget that, that we are, you know, uh, in relationship with one another, please do take care uh, and have grace for one another through this period, um, uh, because it is so very important. So thank you. I'll just say in response to Angie's point, you know, what's the future, you know, it's not, you know, what we wanted to do with the book, Karina and I, is just to open a possible different future, but it's up to all of us really to shape it. You know, it's not about what I think or Karina thinks or we both together think or don't think, but 
you know, if, if the if the book or this work that other people are doing, like Raywin Connell or Badur, as we heard a couple of weeks ago, it's about all of us picking up these ideas and running with them and see where we get, you know. Uh, so yes, uh, and uh, I'll just end there. Great, thank you so much. On that note, I, I want to again thank Jose and Carita for their generosity and their words and, and their hearts. And it's been wonderful. And um, I hope uh, we can continue to learn from you in, in the future. And it was fantastic. And thanks again. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Please let's uh, maybe uh, give them a, a last round of applause and then we'll, we'll see you all again, hopefully soon. Thank you. <laughs>